entertainment in the metaverse. All right, we're gonna let me let me do that again. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful afternoon. My name is Regina Lay. I'm gonna be your moderator for today. The session is titled Token and Sense, Enjoying Real World Lifestyle and Entertainment in the Metaverse. Just very quickly, two lines about it. We're talking about is the fact that the internet is traditionally two-dimensional, right? We're seeing text and images on a flat screen. And typically the metaverse is thought of as three-dimensional three and multi-sensory. Um, although at this point in time, the full vision for the metaverse remains hard to define and seemingly fantastical, certain pieces have certainly started to feel very real. But again, bring us back to the question, what exactly is the metaverse and what does it mean for us in our daily lives? All right, um, and with that, let me introduce my panelists for today, kicking off with David Lynch. He's the group CTO for Bolt Tech, an insure tech company. We've also got Nikita Nan Nguyen. She's the co-founder and C CEO of NF Niftify. Sorry, I caught myself right there in time. Perhaps. And then Hugh Ko as well. He's the co-founder and chief vision officer for Kessel and Mortar Closing. So I'm going to give each of them a few minutes to introduce themselves and where they work. Uh, kicking off with David, then going to Nikita, and finally wrapping with Hugh. David. Thanks, Regina. Hi, I'm David Lynch. As Regina said, I'm the group CTO for Bolt Tech. We're an insurance exchange. Uh, we've got around 40 billion in uh, quoted premium annually and, and around 5 billion in active uh, premium on platform at the moment. That makes us the world's largest technology enabled. Uh, insurance exchange. So super pleased to be here today with the other guest speakers. Fantastic. Nikita? Awesome. Uh, thanks, Regina. My name is uh, Nikita. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Niftify. We are a um, NFT marketplace storefront uh, builder platform. Uh, Niftify allows people to build NFT storefront and marketplace without any coding and upfront cost at all. We launched last July, and so far we have gained over 10,000 registered users with over 2,000 NFT Marketplace is launched using our platform. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Wonderful. Regina. Thanks, Regina, for introduction. Hey, guys, my name is Hugh, one of the co-founders, as well as uh, Chief Vision Officer of PMC, also stands for Festival Motor Clothing. Um, ideally, we are, uh, I like to tell people that we're actually a storytelling brand, a storytelling streetwear brand. Uh, we've been in the business of selling cool since 2010, so we've been doing it for now about 13 years. Um, recently launched an NFT project uh, earlier this year in conjunction with the Year of the Tiger. So just here to be able to share our experiences. Thanks, Regina. Wonderful, thanks, Hugh. All right, um, I think we're talking to an audience today of vastly different backgrounds. So I wanted to start with the basics, which is let's define things first, okay? Let's define the metaverse and what exactly the role of NFTs are in this world. Um, ladies first, why don't you kick us off, Nikita? What do you, how would you describe the metaverse and the role of NFTs in it? Yes, I think that, you know, to, uh, to, uh, most, uh, to simplify it, uh, we can say metaverse is like the digital, the 3D, the digital world um, that we can create on the blockchain. And NFT is to represent the ownership of all the digital assets that will exist on the blockchains. Hugh, before the session, we were chatting about what you've actually done in this space and you were just telling me about a um, NFT project that you kicked off for Chinese New Year. Tell us about that. Sure, Regina. Um, so um, we actually launched an NFT project, it's called Tiger Archives, and this was actually in collaboration with uh, Tiger Beer. Um, and I think, I think one of the main things of this project is that, you know, it's very apt for the, the period of time, you know, it being Chinese New Year and obviously commemorating the Year of the Tiger as well. Uh, so we actually launched 6,688 Lucky Tigers uh, and each of them somewhat signify like different things, uh, whether it be a lot of it, you know, somewhat feature like Lucky Charms and obviously within Chinese culture, um, you know, a lot of that, it's like a great way to somewhat kickstart your year. Uh, but I think what somewhat sets us apart from other NFT projects out there is that 
um, at PMC and, and what we've been doing for streetwear, it's always been about like community building and a lot of in real life type experiences. So even for like this project, you know, one of our big challenges and something that we wanted to make sure that we could really get spot on was really that in real life uh, utility. So, um, you know, being an owner of the Tiger Archives, you know, it opens up a series of whether it be uh, beer redemption, monthly beer redemption programs, number one. Second of all, like a whole bunch of like in real life parties that we've been doing. Uh, the last one we actually did out in LA uh, during, during NFT LA itself. Uh, we've got something happening to Singapore as well. And also a big part of the project as well is like gift back. So we have actually allocated about 30% of whatever that we, that we made from the project itself to be able to support artists and musicians from the region of Southeast Asia. So, you know, we want to be able to be a platform to be able to champion that in a nutshell. Fantastic. And, and this is, um, you were able to sell not just within Malaysia, but internationally, correct? Yeah, I think when it comes to, you know, NFTs itself, it's, it's not only like a Malaysian market, but really a global market, right? I think this was also one of the reasons why we decided to get into it. You know, how else can we, uh, a quicker way to somewhat create more branding awareness uh, globally? So, you know, through this project, you know, one of our biggest demographics was actually coming from Singapore. Secondly, Malaysia. And then thirdly, was actually the United States and North America. Um, so, yeah, that's where majority of the chunk of uh, our holders somewhat sit. But obviously, we've got, you know, the other, the other countries as well. It's uh, become a truly borderless experience. Uh, David, what about the metaverse is so interesting to you guys? I mean, you're in the insert tech. What, what are you doing in this space? Yeah, good question, Regina. And I, I think it's always good to learn from others in the space. But I, I think to get everyone grounded, we, we don't see a great difference between the word cyberspace and metaverse. And I think a lot of the, the media is supporting that. So we, we know over the last 10, 15, 20 years, there have been various forms of metaverses that, that have been formed. I think Second Life was was one that sort of paved the way in the early days. But what, what's really happened in the last few years with, with blockchain and NFTs, we, we're starting to see a, a really significant shift in the way that people interact with technology, something that's far more focused around immersive experiences, virtual reality, augmented reality. We know that things like 5G are creating the, the bandwidth and the throughput to enable those immersive experiences to operate. And because of what we heard from Nikita and Hugh, we know that people are spending sizable amounts of money in these metaverses, whether that's purchasing uh, digital assets, whether it's pur purchasing virtual property. And one of the things we know being in the insurance space is where people have assets, there are emerging insurance and protection needs around those assets. So I would say, from an insurance perspective, we're at a very nascent or early stage in understanding those needs. We, we're, we need to experiment. We need to be inside those universes in order to be able to tailor make and customize products that are fit for purpose to be sold inside these digital ecosystems that are rapidly growing in popularity. So I'd say early stages for us, but it's a super interesting space. It is also super interesting to hear you talk about protection and insurance needs in the metaverse. Um, I know you said it's early, early uh, in the bowl game, but what kind of reception have you guys been getting? Is it is it more or less similar to how you would do it? Well, in in real life. Well, I one of the ways I, I think that's a great way of thinking of getting started is thinking about building a, a digital twin, and and there are many businesses today that have a a physical presence or they have a combined physical and digital presence. Uh, one of the things that I think the metaverse offers is to bring all that together in, in a fully immersive experience. And we, we've been running some experiments. We've got small groups of people across the company that are very, very interested in the space. They're spending time on their weekends and in their evenings uh, inside these worlds, whether they're gaming or whether they're exploring or just learning uh, how to apply themselves in, in new technology. But if we were just creating a replica of the world we know today, I don't think we're taking full advantage of what the metaverse has to offer. There's really limitless possibility. And it does require a unique set of skills. It requires people that have very vivid imaginations to think about mm. how we could create 
a digital world that is so far and beyond the world that we're currently living in. So I, I think it, it's naturally got a very creative element to that. Uh, I think, you know, just in terms of where we're at as a company, I, I would say we're still very much at a exploratory stage. We see a few thematic areas, uh, you know, branding opportunity. We see sales opportunity. We know that insurance sales today through agencies is quite limited in terms of um, how vivid the representations and the visualizations can be of, say, a loss event. Um, we know that there has to be unique products created for these metaverses, and we know that there's potentially a role for our suite of APIs. Uh, we can bring those APIs into virtually any ecosystem, and the metaverse represents a new and interesting distribution channel potentially. Wow, it's 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 also exciting. And then and then as far as insurance goes, at the core of it, what what do what, what do you insure? Is it just the financial um, value, the the, the financial um, uh, asset? Is that what you're protecting against? Well, well, I think again, early stages. But the, the interesting thing is, it's not just about NFTs and digital assets. We we see within the metaverse there can be this crossover between uh, digital and and let's say traditional assets. So there, there's no reason other than the fact we've got to make sure we we remain compliant with regulations. But there's no reason why an insurance agency couldn't operate within a metaverse. So they could be selling fairly traditional insurance products uh, for fiat currency, not necessar necessarily mm. in crypto, but we see that they, they would coexist inside a metaverse and we can <laughs> potentially offer the full spectrum of insurance products. So it's not just about uh, things like cyber protection and identity protection and um, NFT or digital asset protection. There's absolutely no reason why we couldn't be doing pet and auto and homeowners and some of those traditional insurance products very much alongside. So it's that coexistence that I think represents an opportunity. Wow, it's amazing. It, it, I mean, it's such a world of opportunities out there, right? Um, Nikita, in terms of um, uh, what in our daily lives will transition into the metaverse, um, apart from gaming, right? You guys cater to people who build marketplaces for NFTs. What sort of trends are you seeing? Um, uh, what sort, what kind of businesses are people launching? Um, yes, I think that we are actually witnessing a, like David said, a cross over time between the real world and the metaverse. And I think that it's very interesting that uh, we got to see all this uh, mainstream businesses coming and transforming, um, utilizing the NFT to create a new business, a new revenue stream for their already existing business. Um, and we've seen use cases in, for example, in uh, music industry, um, you know, you've heard about Snoop Dogg, uh, but actually on Niftify, we also host a lot of uh, musicians that use NFT as, for example, a key uh, for their fan club. Uh, or, you know, is like a key to access uh, exclusive membership and things like that. Um, and then we also, I think that one of the most um, exciting and uh, interesting use cases uh, is in real estate that we've done this uh, with a Malaysian real estate company. Um, they use the NFT um, as a tool, right, uh, a medium for people, for individual and small investors to do uh, fractional, fractional investment. Um, so usually it's very difficult for anyone to invest into the tallest building in Malaysia, but by doing so, they allow a thousand people to co-own one unit of the highest and most luxury uh, unit in the tallest building in Malaysia. And then, you know, like uh, Hugh said about utility, um, they comes with a lot of perks and benefits, including, for example, you know, the 12% um, interest, uh, annual interest, uh, which is already a lot higher than um, saving in a bank account mm. uh, or any other, you know, um, stable and safe uh, investment uh, vehicle. And then um, owners will also be able to stay in the unit for one or two nights. It depends on, you know, how much they invest in um, the unit. 
Um, and also, you know, I see other, um, even in the financial uh, institutions, um, you know, some of the biggest credit card companies, they also talk to us and, um, you know, trying to figure out how to use the NFT to create new business uh, and how to enter the NFT as well as the metaverse world. Um, some of the other industries that uh, we have seen um, in crypt media. So uh, you see, you know, um, media companies, they work with big stars, movies, musicians, um, you know, entertainers, artists, and they have huge amount of um, digital digital uh, contents that can be the, you know, very interesting items on the metaverse. So they also exploring ways how to util utilize those and um, uh, monetize uh, those assets. So I see uh, people coming from um, all walks of life coming to see, you know, how they can enter this NFT and metaverse. And that's what I see. <laughs> That is amazing. Um, I'm particularly interested about that credit card anecdote, uh, you guys talking to the credit card companies. Uh, tell us a bit more about what kind of conversations you've been having. How would they, how do they envision that it will work in the metaverse? So uh, we are still discussing with one of them and I can only say that they are one of the largest one. Um, so it's, it's kind of confi it's confidential. So uh, I'm not allowed to you know, tell you more than that. Uh, but um, I can tell you that about two weeks ago, right? You must have uh, seen the article about Visa, Visa mm. card. Um, they launched a program to allow their uh, merchants to do business uh, in the NFT space uh, with them. Uh, and they have a funds to support their merchants uh, doing so. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that um, they can be very creative and they have different ideas about how to do it and how to customize as well as, you know, make it uh, fit into what they're doing and uh, the kind of um, clientele that they have uh, to do different businesses in the NFT uh, and yeah. metaverse. Right, exactly. And, and and that's exactly it, right? Like the big traditional businesses like Visa and MasterCard getting into the space is what people are saying is what's going to have heralded actually the mainstreaming of NFTs, right? Um, Hugh, I've got a question from the floor for you um, specifically. Uh, what are Petzl and Mortar Clothing's plans for NFTs beyond the Tiger Archive? Yeah. yeah what are you so planning to do next? Sure, sure, sure. Actually, a whole bunch of uh, you know different ideas have have come ever since we we launched our we launched our project. I think that's the amazing thing about this space where it's it really boils down to the community. Like in terms of the learning curve for the past like six eight months that we've been working on this project, it's been extremely steep. But uh, I think like what David said, extremely exciting as well. Um, for us, we're actually looking at a whole bunch of different things. I think first up. Uh, we speak about, we're talking a lot of it about the metaverse itself. Uh, you know, as a, as a brand, we are looking at acquiring some sort of like virtual land and uh, it's still currently in the midst. And, and the way that we're actually looking at it is that, you know, we're storytellers at heart and end of the day, we just use like different type of canvases to tell our story. So whether it be the metaverse, whether it be our clothing, you know, previously or whether it be through NFTs, uh, you know, we really see these as like just different verticals to be able to tell that whole brand story. Um, at the same point of time, when it comes to like, you know, what, what do we actually intend to, 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 to use uh, our virtual land for is, is, is mainly just going to revolve around like, you know, building like a clubhouse. Uh, I spoke a lot about being a platform to be able to highlight artists as well as musicians from Southeast Asia. And that's something that we want to be able to champion. So whether it be uh, an art gallery showcasing artwork, uh, that could be one. Uh, second of all as well is uh, we spoke also about that whole gift back element. Uh, so that as well where um, we want to be able, I mean, even though we'll be doing like that main short list of just say 30 or 40 people that we want to be able to give that money to, uh, but ideally we want the community to be able to decide, you know, where exactly the money goes to. So, you know, using that as a platform, as, as just a tool of communication where uh, maybe the people who are applying for the grant uh, can actually present their ideas and what they hope to achieve. Um, and then from there, at least that's the way the community will be able to digest that information and obviously place that vote. So that's one part of it. Uh, another part as well is that we've been 
we've been looking a lot at you know what what we're good at and um i think me and the team our, you know what we're strong at is obviously creativity and then second of all is as, uh, is also manufacturing so something that we're potentially looking at or exploring at this current stage um you know could be a platform when it comes to nft merchandise um i think that's something that we already have all that infrastructure already built for uh, and obviously, I think there's a big market for it as well, you know, within NFTs, uh, as more and more projects uh, come about. So these are two things uh, that people can somewhat expect in the near future. That's amazing. You've got your hands in a lot of different pots. Um, David, what do you foresee would be the most insured item in the metaverse in the next five years? That's a question coming from the floor. And I have to say, it's got to be land and pets, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think a super good question. I, I, I can't help uh, in terms of framing an answer to that to, again, feed off a little bit from Nikita and Hugh because I, I think you've got two individuals on the panel here who are very actively participating in the space to know what people really care about. So when I heard uh, Nikita talk about, you know, the tallest building in Malaysia and the fact you can buy a, a fractionalised um, share of a, a high-end apartment, it, it makes me wonder, you know, is the traditional insurance industry today geared up to offer protection and insurance for a product like that? So I think you're, you're spot on in terms of the opportunity around real estate uh, and whether that's virtual real estate or the crossover into physical real estate. It, it's very clear that the nature of the products that insurers offer are going to have to evolve very substantially to be able to offer that fractionalized insurance class. But what, what I think the second part of that answer is as well, uh, Hugh, when he spoke about these lucky tigers, it, you know, it's the, the phenomenon around why people are, are paying good money and why, why they're giving up their crypto assets for these, uh, these, these digital assets or NFTs creates a whole spectrum of new opportunities. And I, I think as a, as a broader type of asset class, I think protection for NFTs is going to be another really, really interesting opportunity for um, for pioneering insurance companies, I would say. Actually, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, why would you not insure an NFT, right? Absolutely, and it's it's really like like I said in the opening. Uh, we we know the way that industry has evolved over many many years. Wherever there's an asset, wherever there's a risk, there's a protection need that follows. I think that the broader question that the insurance industry has got to answer is, is traditional uh, reinsurance or our traditional risk pools the way in which we need to be thinking about protecting these assets? So if you look at industry examples like Etherisk, uh, some of you may be familiar with that, the entire value chain of insurance has been decentralized. So much in the way that we saw in, in today's world, uh, the rapid rise of things like P2P financing we may see a very similar evolution in terms of the buildup of those risk pools where participants in the metaverse and participants in these NFT marketplaces and ecosystems also want to participate in offering protection products in a more decentralized nature than the way the industry operates today. That is certainly an interesting idea, right? And not too far off, I would say. Um, speaking about the tallest building in Malaysia, Nikita, uh, coming back to one of your stories, can you tell us which building that actually was? Um, the one that you helped tokenize and what, what sort of traction has it gotten since then? I forgot the name, uh, yeah, but it was uh, we can always look it up because it's on our directory on, on the platform. Um, well, not Petronas, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know much about Malaysia, to be honest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that they sold around um, a thousand units, uh, a thousand portions, and each uh, was sold for a thousand USDT. So um, they sold about a million worth of revenue, I think. Okay, so it, it has had a lot of interest too. Yes, yes, an annual interest of 12%. Where do you see the NFT adoption um, in the next, over the next three years? Um, and what value or use case would they be most likely attached to? Again, that's a question coming from the floor. I still think that, you know, just from um, 
from being an insider, even though you know we um, having a lot of um, interest from mainstream businesses. Um, however, I think that uh, they are still being very um, cautious as well as conservative in terms of the legal frameworks uh, not being established yet. Um, so uh, there's still a lot of looking around, watching, observing from them, from big companies. Uh, but I think, um, you know, uh, in terms of what's really going on right now, the biggest investment is still in gaming industry. Um, some of the biggest VCs, they, you know, they still um, throwing a lot of money into game studios, uh, looking for, you know, more games so that, you know, they can have more funnels um, to increase the NFT as well as, you know, the digital assets in the metaverse to build, um, you know, multiple different metaverses in the future. Uh, so I do see that. And also, you know, as... Um, as the um, metaverse uh, develops, I think that there's also a chance for entertainment, uh, music, uh, fashion, and things like that to um, develop too. So I can see that those are the, er the areas that we can see a lot of transactions going on in the next few years. Right, so still gaming uh, leading the way at this point, and you've got the usual suspects, uh, sports, uh, fashion, and music, right? Um, I, I do want to ask a question, and pardon me if this is a bit silly, but as a lay person, right, um, when I look across, when I look in that space, I mean, I think there's so many metaverses, right? Everyone's building, you know, their own thing. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, the biggest right now is... Um, what is it? Is it the central land? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so how do you think this is going to play out in the end? I mean, right now it's a bit of a wild west, it's a bit of a land grab, but how? Yeah. What is the end game going to look like? I think the end game is going to look like our uh, cosmos right now. So it's going to be infinite, right? We have um, so many different galaxies, different planets, different stars. You don't even know how many more than, you know, the, the sand that we have on Earth, right? Um, I don't know how many will actually um, exist in the end, survive in the end, but I think that there will be a lot uh, multiple metaverses uh, because just picture it as one metaverse is an, an ideal um, world that uh, a community built together right so for example if you have a game like uh, uh, say half-life and that is a world where you go shooting and um, shooting for a living and you live in that kind of world so you have that experience but in another world um, like you know player one right you have different experiences and different platforms different metaverses uh, provide different experience to the participants um, so i think that it depends on uh, the builders and the communities uh, what they want to build and how much they can attract attract people to join the community that makes them um, survive and exist in the future. And that will be, you know, um, as many as we can imagine and build. Wow, so everyone can coexist harmoniously together. David, any thoughts? Sorry, yeah. would you? I, th I think what we're also going to see is we're, we're going to see developers uh, crossing platforms and building services that, that are transient across platforms. So. One of the things that I, th I think we have to think about, we tend to think of identity in, in its singular form. And one of the possibilities that the metaverse opens up is uh, we as individuals can have multiple identities in, in the metaverse. So it's very critical that many of the services that are being built out can operate cross-platform. I guess counter to that, the, the media is obviously speculating very heavily that Apple, for example, may be shortly to release its own VR headset and possibly a, a closed ecosystem like they, they tend to do. Now, remains to be seen if that's actually true, but they do have a knack of perfecting the experience. So to what extent 
uh, they, they can feed off their, their phenomenal ecosystem to uh, launch a, a, you know, more of a private metaverse. That's going to be interesting to watch that play out. So again, for, for us in the insurance industry, that open, opens up other interesting possibilities for cyber protection or a, a complete rethink of what identity protection means. Um, we know in the industry today, a lot of that cyber product is very much geared towards businesses. It's not necessarily ubiquitous as a consumer product. And um, we've got to think through what that means in the context of multiple identities and potentially multiple identities in multiple metaverses. Well, yeah, pretty much, uh, I guess what Nikita was saying is, well, everyone can just, uh, it, there could be an infinite number of them, essentially. Hugh, any thoughts around this? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, definitely the guys explained it extremely well. Um, obviously, what we're seeing right now is all the titans of the world, uh, like David mentioned, whether it be Apple, you know, Meta, Alphabet, all these guys are pouring so much money and funds into this. Um you know, but, but I think a big part of it as well is uh, obviously Web3 embodies decentralization. That's like the key word. And, uh, you know, just because of the way that each of us are wired, you know, whether it be institution, education, even family upbringing, it's always going to be like put us, uh, you know, the focus is always going to be on us first before anyone else. And obviously that's unfortunate, but, but that, that's just the way, you know, uh, life is. Um, obviously, we hope that, um, you know, the idea right now, because of Web3 and the blockchain technology that people, you know, there, there could be that one platform where, you know, builders are building towards a common goal. Uh, but I think that would actually take a lot of time, uh, probably not in our generation, but I think the generation of tomorrow that, that could be, we could actually be seeing that. And, and the reason why I say that is, you know, I, I look at my, whether it be my nieces, whether it be even my friend's kids, uh, I think the first thing, the way that they consume information is very, very different uh, from how our generation, you know, we consume information. So I think first up, um, an, an example would be like my friend's son, he refuses to answer his, uh, any messages via WhatsApp, but it's only via Discord. Like if you want to talk to him, it's only by I'm Discord. sorry, That's by Discord. One. Okay. It's yeah, it's a communication tool used uh, very yeah, widely yeah, within yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I know Discord. I'm just uh, surprised that WhatsApp is out now. It feels like it wasn't so long ago when it was the in <laughs> thing, and now it's out. Oh, I'm sorry. What a filthy what a dinosaur I am. <laughs> and uh, I think I think even secondly as well, like you speak about all these metaverses, right? Like Roblox is obviously a big one, like popular among a lot of young kids. And that is the way that, you know, they used to uh, meet friends. They play games on Roblox. Uh, you know, that's what we're seeing. So um, I think the idea here as well is that it's, it's just a matter of time um, that, you know, people, I think Generation Tomorrow would understand this a lot better. And uh, obviously as a business, you know, one thing to constantly stay relevant, uh, I think, you know, keeping all eyes on the space as well is going to be very, very important. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, as someone who straddles a lot of worlds, um, how far behind do you think the Southeast Asia region is in terms of NFT and blockchain adoption when compared to the West? Um, and what so you actually, the second part of that question is what potential catalysts could there be for greater and faster adoption here? Yeah, so actually um, I was doing like a whole bunch of like research as I was building like a recent pitch deck and uh, surprisingly, actually, Singapore and China, obviously, uh, is is one is actually the biggest the biggest space when it comes to NFTs compared to the world uh, in terms of adoption of uh, NFTs as well as cryptocurrency. Uh, I think that's the first thing. Uh, second of all, in terms of um, you know awareness itself, and I, a lot of times I like to say that you know in Southeast Asia we've always been like that that second child. Uh, in you know in, in in the room or within that family itself um um and, and i think what 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 we actually need to do more of is actually create more platforms just because we have a tons of talented people coming from this area in terms of you know whatever industry it may be but i think whether it be the countries themselves or the governments you know providing the support uh and of course you know whether it be individuals like myself which are building within the space uh, to actually, you know, become that platform to to support these people. 
Uh, so that that is something that we you know we hope to be able to achieve, and obviously that's like the bigger and greater goal for us. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, running out of time, I do want to pose the same question to both David and Nikita just very quickly in terms of you know um, how far behind Southeast Asia is in this whole in this whole process in the innovation aspect in particular, and what needs to happen here. I, th right. I think from my perspective, there, there's a real desire I see in Southeast Asia to experiment. Uh, we've got, even inside our company, uh, people that are queuing up to, to be a part of some of our initiatives in this space. I think we've got the creative talent. Uh, what we might lack a little bit in Southeast Asia is the scale. Obviously, when we look at markets like China, Indonesia, the, the United States, uh, the, the scale factor there makes it probably more conducive to getting the bigger investment dollars to really pursue the big brands and the really big use cases and to run some of these hugely iconic events like the, you know, the metaverse fashion week recently, those sorts of things that, that can get enormous attention and traction. Um, but I, I think like we, we know with most industries in Southeast Asia that um, we'll see different flavors of participation. It's not a, it's not a monoculture in, in the part of the world that we operate in and, um, I think that it's really got to be that courage to get ourselves out of that web two paradigm and get into the web three mode and, and start experimenting and understanding. And I think that the business will follow. Because you won't really know until you give it a try, right? Absolutely. Um, Nikita. Yes, I think, um, you know, from my, well, what I see um, actually, um, the biggest NFT project in the world right now, Axie Infinity, comes from Vietnam, and Vietnam is mm. in Southeast Asia, right? That's true. Um, and um, but the way that I see it is, um, Southeast Asia is targeted as a um, consumer market more than a builder market, um, unfortunately. And I totally agree with David that you know um, that uh, it it lacks the scalability because of the, I'm not sure if it's, it's the legal framework or what that kind of limits the investment into the um, Southeast Asian startups. Um, so, you know, that kind of limits our, our uh, capability to go out to the world and offer what we have. But I do see a lot of startups um, around myself in Vietnam, as well as other countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, they building, um, they there are a lot of projects in the builder community, uh, building a lot of different uh, interesting projects, including Nifty Five. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of potential, right? It's just, uh, just needs to be tapped. Potentially. And also, I think that, you know, Southeast Asia um, and Asia in general, I think that we have a great um, talent pool, especially mm. the uh, blockchain engineers. Uh, we have a lot of engineers, um, talented, young, um, hungry, and very, you know, uh, eager to learn. Uh, also very fast in learning new technology too. So I think that is also an uh, advantage um, that, you know, may change um, the image of Southeast Asia in the next few years. Yeah, I think absolutely. Hopefully. I think that's, that's going to be a huge advantage, especially with um, a very young demographic that's really, right. you know, that takes to this kind of of innovation like it's second mm -hmm. nature as Hugh was pointing out earlier all right um I believe that is all the time we have for today unfortunately I mean I could keep going with this for another hour but we do have other sessions to get to so Nikita Nguyen, Nifty Fi, David Lynch, Bolt Tech and Hugo uh Pethel and Mortar Clothing we thank you so much for your insights today it's been a fruitful discussion and thank you everyone for tuning in I'm Regina Lay thank you so much thanks, thanks Regina